Okay, but I'm going to talk about my book about life after death. That's what I meant. It's, we're going a little serious here for a little bit. Because I, I talk at this also at ashrams all over the world. And they said it goes along perfectly with their teachings, with the Hindu religion. So I'm involved with a lot of different religions too. Because it makes so much sense. <coughs> but in my work, when you do the past life regressions, in order to do it correctly, you must take the person through the death experience. And a lot of hypnosis classes say, no, no, don't touch that, it's dangerous. It is not, because I've done thousands and thousands of people, and I've had them die in every way imaginable you could think of. And nobody's been harmed if you know what you're doing. And that's why I know it can't hurt. But during all that time, the 30 years I've been doing the past life regressions steadily, I took so many people through the death experience because in the death experience, sometimes the answer for the problems in this lifetime, you know, uh, phobias, allergies, you can see where that would come from, the way they died in the other life, but also medical things that are wrong with the body go back to the way they died in the other lifetime. So all of this is very important. So I found by taking hundreds of people back to the past lives and bringing them back through the death experience, they all described it the same way. They all said the same thing. So this is not near death. This is what I'm gonna tell you about is what they described as real death, what really happens when you die and when you cross over. Because near death, you go so far. You have to, you have to come back. But this is what happens whenever you go all the way. And I usually give a longer lecture, so I'm gonna to try to stick to the main points and then we'll see if you have any questions. Because I encompass just about everything you could possibly wanna know in this, this subject. Okay, what I found out, well people say this makes them to where they're not afraid anymore when they find these things out. And also they like to know if somebody has died, they wanna know where they went. So these are important things to find out about. Okay, when the person goes through the death experience and they're dying, they said the first thing, the body, they feel very cold. Then the next instant, they're standing by the bed looking down at the body. It's that quick. The, uh, they say it's just like getting up from one chair and sitting down in another chair. You just slide right out of the body. So they are standing next to the bed, looking down at the body, and they'll say, gee, I didn't know I looked that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and believe me, the last thing they'd want to do is go back into that body. Usually it's sick or it's diseased, and there's no hope of it ever getting well. They don't want to go back to it, because the next thing that comes into their mind is, hey, I'm out of there. I'm free. I can go anywhere I want. I can do anything I want. So that's what they want to do. They want to go on. They want to go home, really. It's the people who are left behind are the ones who uh, grieve about it. They want them to stay with them. But do you really want them to be back in a body like that, that most of the time there's no hope for them? It's better to realize to let them go, because when you hold on to it, you're being selfish, it's just for yourself. I don't want, I want to, I'm gonna miss them. I want them to be with me. I don't know what I'll do without you, that kind of thing. And it's a selfish thing because really, the parts I'm gonna go through is you make a contract when you come in. And in this contract, you also make an exit plan. So all of this is planned before you ever come into the life. So the person is ready to go on. They have completed their mission, they have completed everything they're supposed to do. They don't know this consciously, but they, it is part of a plan. So the person who is grieving doesn't understand that. It's time for them to go. They are going back home, and you have to continue with your life as part of your plan and your contract. Anyway, the first thing they want to they say is, oh boy, I'm out of here. I'm gonna to get to leave, I can go home. And they, I've found you are never alone. 
This is one of the greatest fears people have. They think when they die, they're going to be alone, going into the great unknown. That's not what happens. You are never alone. You're never alone when you're alive either, but you don't realize that. Because when you come into a lifetime, you have a guardian angel, if you want to call it that, a guardian angel or a guide that is assigned to you specifically. They have to be with you your entire lifetime. They have to take care of you. They have to be there for you. And they love to help you, but they can't interfere. They can only help if you ask for help. And if you do, boy, do they take over. But sometimes it can be a deceased relative that is assigned to you to be your guardian angel. But you do have one. And if your life gets a little complicated, you may have more than one. You can have as many as four, all taking care of different things. And if your life takes a sudden turn in a different direction, Sometimes these guides will change places and another one will come in that has more expertise in your field that you're going into. So you always have somebody there. So whenever you actually die and leave the body, you always have someone, I call them the greeters. Someone will come to be, meet you and take you where you're supposed to go. Now all of you have probably been with somebody dying in a hospital and they see unseen people around the bed. Have you ever had that happen? Usually it's deceased relatives. They see them standing around the bed. This is very real. The doctors and the nurses try to say, well, it's just the drugs or the oxygen deprivation because they're, they're dying. No, it's very real. And I've had other nurses say it happens a lot, that they will see people there. And you notice they're always very happy. So-and-so is here, you know, and they know they're going to go with them, husband, relative, or whatever it is. So if they aren't there, the guide or guardian angel will be there, but you'll always have somebody to take you where you're supposed to go. So then they're taken to the other side. Now, usually when I'm talking to an audience, I say, how many of you have ever had near-death experiences? There's always people in the audience that say they have had near-death experiences. I don't care what the doctors say, it's very, very real. That I've had enough proof of it in my work, I know it's very real. But in most of the near-death experiences, the person either going through a tunnel or they're going out of their body, they are going toward a huge light. And they never reach that light. They usually are turned back before they get to that light. Usually there's somebody there who says, are you sure you want to go? You know, you have a choice, but maybe it'd be better if you go back. You know, your family needs you, things like that. But sometimes there's someone there to give you a choice if you want to return or do you really want to go on? It's your decision. But whenever they decide to go back, they never go all the way to that bright light. I found out what that bright light is. This is why they don't actually die, because they don't go all the way. The bright light is a huge energy source. You may even want to call it God if you want to, but it's a powerful energy source. And when you actually do leave your body and die, you go through that light. And when you go through that light, the silver cord is severed at that time. You're all attached with a silver cord, our spirit, which is the real you, and the body the entire time you're alive. Because every night you go out of your body. Everybody does. The spirit, the real you, imagine how bored it would get sitting around waiting for the body to wake up. <laughs> the body's what gets tired. The real you doesn't. And so it's sitting around waiting for you to get up. Okay, let's get on with it. As soon as the body goes to sleep, you're out of there, having all kinds of adventures. You're going to the spirit side, you're talking to your guides and your masters and getting instructions, or you're off anywhere you want to go in the world, seeing people, looking in on them, whatever you want to do, or you can go off to other planets, other dimensions. You do this every night, but you don't know it because uh, well, you're not supposed to know it, for one thing. It'd be too confusing. But the only way you remember is if you have dreams of flying, 
our dreams of strange, unfamiliar places. So we're off having all these adventures all every night. And in toward morning, when it's time to get back to the body, we are connected with the silver cord the whole time. You're reeled in, so to speak. They reel you back in to where you're back in the body again. Then the body has to wake up and you're ready to continue your daily work. So whenever you actually die, you go through this energy source. At that time, the silver cord is severed immediately by the energy. When that happens, you cannot return to the body again. That's the spark of life. Once that spark of life has left the body, it begins to deteriorate immediately. If you ever watch someone die, you know something's gone, it's left. At that point, the body begins to deteriorate. Then you're on the other side and you cannot come back. The only way you can have, you have ghosts, you have people coming back and giving messages, apparitions, but it's not the actual person because they can't come back into the body again. So once you get over there, you're met with great love. There is no hell. There isn't. I've done thousands and thousands of cases. There is no hell. Hell is an invention of the church, and you can see why. It was never in the Bible. It was never, it's something has been invented. There is no hell. A loving God would not do that to people. You are allowed to make all the mistakes you want. You're allowed to come back and do it again and again till you get it right. They don't punish you just because you make a mistake and throw you into an oven. It doesn't work that way. You have to realize you have made mistakes. Earth is a school, but it's a school, you come here to learn lessons, but it's a school where you can't skip a grade, but you can have to repeat a grade. You don't get it right. You have to come back and do it again until you get it right. You can't go from kindergarten to college. It's impossible. You have to learn the lessons, and each, the lessons are not easy. Earth is a school where you learn emotions and limitations. Those are the two main things, emotions and limitations. Those are not taught on other planets. This is a very challenging planet. So you come here to learn these things, and it's all important lessons. I tell people, everyone has bad things that happen in their life. That's life. But what did you learn from that bad thing? If you learned even one thing, that was the reason for the experience. If you say you didn't learn anything, you're going to have to come back and repeat it again, the same circumstance. It's all teaching us something. And that's what it's all about. It's not easy. Life is not easy. The problem is when we come back, we don't remember why we came for. But I'm getting ahead of myself. OK, once you get over there, I have found three different places that you can go to. Now you go to the place that you are tuned to by your vibration and your frequency. Because you can't go to anything else. You have to be vibrating at that frequency. And as you become more advanced, as you learn more, each time you die, you'll go a little higher and a little higher. Different places over there because of the vibration and frequency will match as you grow. You don't want to keep what I call the wheel of karma. You just keep going round and round and around, making the same mistakes. You're not going anywhere. You're not advancing. You're not doing anything. You're just paying, playing the same old game again and again. That's why we have to get out of that rut. So the three places that I have found, it's the lower astral is what I'm going to talk about first, the lower astral. And of course, all these places are divided into many other compartments, also depending on your frequency. The lower astral, I don't think anybody in this room is going to have to worry about. <laughs> those are those people who we might consider earthbound. They have lived in such a negative life that they don't realize they can go anywhere else. All they know is life. And these are like the ones who are the murderers, the, um, the drug addicts, the alcoholics, the ones that are, they just don't want to come out of where they are. The, the very negative people. 
when they die, they don't know they're dead because they, they think they're still alive. They don't know anything is going on. And they're so confused because they have died in this kind of a condition that they keep trying to get back into bodies, which you cannot do. I have never found there is no such thing as possession. There is no such thing as demonics because the soul is protected solely by a shield. But they will try. And you can be influenced if you're drinking or if you're on drugs. You can be influenced by these kind of entities. But, see, they don't realize they have died. And what they're trying to do is get the same sensations they had through osmosis, hanging around people who are drinking or who are on drugs or who are killing people in back alleys, trying to get the same sensations and pleasures they had when they were alive. Well, the, the greeter, the one who's supposed to take them on, is there, and they're shaking their heads, saying, well, when are you going to get here? No, I'm here. You know, you're supposed to go on. But they get so involved in it. But after a while, it's like, this is boring. I can't get the same sensations. I can't do it. I can't get back into what they thought they were supposed to get into. It's boring. There must be something more to it. At that point, they look around and they see the one who has been sent to take them on. They said, are you ready to go now? And so they'll go with them. And they're always met with great love because they know they just went down a wrong path. And all they have to do is, uh, they have to go to schools, they have to take lessons on that side so they can be ready to come back again. You come back too soon, you're not ready because it's that negativity will carry over. So that's the lower astral. And I don't think anybody here is gonna have to worry about that, <laughs> but you should know it's there. The middle astral, is I think the equivalent of what the churches call heaven. It's very beautiful, it's very wonderful. They've all described it the same way, that there's a beautiful lake, there's hills around the lake, there's all kinds of houses. If you decide your idea of heaven is to live in a, a house just like you just left, or maybe one that's better, maybe you want to live in a castle, you can have it. Your idea of what is the best, what is your idea of heaven? That's where you will go to, what kind of a house. If you decide you want to spend eternity living in this house with your, your friends, your relatives who have died, that's your idea of eternity, you can have it. That's what the churches usually talk about as heaven. It's extremely beautiful. Uh, there's music in the air. They said the, the colors are so vibrant that some people who have had near-death experiences bring back that memory of the colors, especially the flowers. There's huge gardens, and the colors are so extraordinary. You've never seen anything like it. And they remember when they come back from near-death experiences, they say every, even the molecules of the plants and things seem to be vibrating for a while as they get back because they have that memory of the colors in their mind. And I asked them one time, is that an imitation of Earth, our plants and flowers? And they said, no, Earth is a very poor imitation of what's over there. If you could imagine flowers that never die, roses that are always perfect, that is what it's like over there. So it's extremely beautiful. So they go and they're living with their relatives, doing everything they ever wanted to do, and this idea of a perfect heaven. The only problem is, it doesn't last. <laughs> That's not the way it is. What are you learning if you just had it perfect forever? So after a little bit, a knock will come at the door, and they'll say, okay, you ready to go up and do the review of your life? And they'll say, what do you mean? I'm perfectly happy right here. I don't want to go anywhere. This is heaven. I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> so... Um, you know, it's not the way it works. You know, you've been here for a little while, but now we got to move on. So they take them up to the review board. And there are boards, there are elders, there's masters. They can't tell you what to do, but they're there to advise you. So you go up and look, and they're going to show you your life. They show you everything you have ever done, every word you've ever said, 
everybody you have ever touched or hurt or anything. And believe me, this is not easy to look at. They're showing it very objectively, but they don't show it just from the viewpoint of you looking at it. They show it from the perspective of everybody you were involved with. You begin to see it from their eyes, from their viewpoint. And believe me, that hurts because all of a sudden they'll say, I didn't know I hurt them like that. I didn't know what I said affected them that way. Because, you know, we do that. We go through life. We don't pay attention to what we're, we're doing to people. But over there, you see it. And you see exactly what you've done and exactly the way that affected the other people. I think if more people understood this, we'd be kinder to people, knowing it's going to come back on us. <laughs> because you don't put yourself in their position. But if you see what you have actually done to that person, then suddenly you say, I've got to repay this. This is what's karma. I can't let this go by. I have to do something to repay what I have done to that person. So then you talk to the other soul. You say, well, we didn't do such a good job, did we? <laughs> uh, maybe we ought to go back and do it again. This time, you be the husband, I'll be the wife. You be the mother, I'll be the child. Because you can switch roles around any way you want. It doesn't make any difference. It's all a play anyway. It's just a game. It's all a play. I've had people go through the death experience, and when they're up on the other side looking down at it, they'll say, it was just a play. I see all the actors in the wings getting ready to come on and play their parts and put on their costumes. It didn't mean anything. But they said, when I was there, it was so intense. It was so much emotion. And I was in the middle of all of this. But they said, from over here, it's like the blink of an eye. You can look at it from two different things. We get caught up in the illusion. These are the things that are important for people to know about. And it is just a game, just a play. But we're playing different parts. Uh, this, you have a body, you are not a body. This is just a suit of clothes, I call a costume, you put on to play this part at this time. The next time around, you know, suits of clothes, no matter how much you attach to them, how much you like them, they are going to wear out. You have to eventually throw them away. And when that happens, you just get another suit of clothes, another costume to play the next part that you're going to have to come back and do again. So. You have to make these plans and you have to make your contract with these people. Okay, let's go back and let's do it again. Let's try this time. Sometimes they've gone through a series of lives with the same people making the same mistakes again and again and again. And it's finally time to tear up the contract and say, it's not working. Let's just forget about it. We tried, but it's not working. So this is what happens in the middle astral. The upper astral is my favorite place because I love knowledge. I'm so curious. I love research. I want to know more. The upper astral is where the schools are. And the, the temple of wisdom complex is my most favorite place. And you got to remember in my work, I've heard hundreds and hundreds of people describe these same things again and again and again. If they all describe the same things without knowing what the others have said, to me that gives it validity because it's like a scientific experiment. But they describe the temple of wisdom complex. It is composed of many different parts. They're like huge temples. They look like Roman temples with the big pillars. Well, one of the parts that they talk about is the healing temple. And I was told I could do a great service to people to let people know about this because you don't have to die to go there. You can go there in meditation. You can go there in your dreams at night to the Temple of Healing. And they showed me long lines of people lined up. They've just died, and they have to go to the Temple of Healing first, like a cleansing, before they can go on to where they're supposed to go. And as they come in, there's always a guardian of each one of these parts. And the guardian of the temple, you know, the, the greeters brought the person in. They take the person into the center of this dome-shaped room. 
And the top of the dome is full of beautiful stones of every color you can imagine. And the light comes down. It is just beautiful, shining down on the floor. And the person stands in the center of this and is bathed in this beautiful light. And what it does, it takes away any residue of anything that you've gone through, maybe the death or anything you've gone through in that life, it just washes it all away so that you can go on to where you're supposed to go. But they said if people wanted to go there and be healed, they could also picture it and go there at night because they said they can tell the ones who are not dead, they see the silver cord trailing behind them <laughs> and they know that they're there for a different reason. Another part of the Temple of Wisdom complex is the tapestry room. And I've written about this in many of my books. The tapestry is huge and it goes for miles. It's on one huge wall. And the people that have seen it said it's almost like it's alive. It's a fabric, but it's like it breathes. It's almost alive. And in this tapestry are many, many threads. Every one of you has a thread in the tapestry. It's the thread of life. And it's the story of your life is in these threads in this tapestry. And it shows how it all interweaves and all interconnects, how we all affect each other and how we are all connected together. So it's like you're one, but you're also everything. So everybody affects everybody else in some way as it all interweaves. And they told us that it'd be very important for people to realize you don't know how much you affect other people. What you say, what you do affects everyone in your life. This is because we're all interwoven and we're all affecting each other. So the tapestry of life is very important. You can see we're all but you understand these things, there's no prejudice, there's no judgment, because we're all the same. We're all trying to, to learn something and get out of this rat race off of the wheel of karma. We're all here for the same reason in this school. You can't judge people, they're just at different stages of their growth and different classes that they're taking. So the tapestry is very important. And it's been explained in several of my books, if you've read mine, about that. Uh, what happens when people go into the tapestry and go on the other side into our concept of time. Okay, and my favorite place is the library. Because every time I go there, there's always a guardian. Now, I don't go, you know, I mean, I'm taking my person there, but I feel I've seen it enough that I know what, how, what it's like, and it's beautiful. There's a guardian of the library. So when you come in, well, I come with the person, and the first thing they want to know, oh, okay, it's you again. What do you want to know now? You know, because <laughs> they know me. So that everything I've written about, my research, I ask them questions, I can have the information because the library contains every information you can think of. This is how I got the information I wrote about Earth mysteries, about Atlantis, all these things by going to the library. Because the library has everything that is all the knowledge that has ever happened and all the knowledge that ever will be that we cannot possibly imagine is all in this library. So it's, to me, it's, it's the most favorite place. And if you want, you can see it as books. You can see it as energy. People have asked me about the Kassik records. They're there also. Uh, you can have access to them. But this is the way you want to obtain the information. You can do it by reading or by accessing the scrolls or however you want to get it. But there are other ways to do it also. And this is how I've got a lot of the things I've written about. Along the sides of the library are rooms. In these rooms, it's rather like going in Star Trek in the holodeck. You step into those rooms. And if there's something you want to know about, it appears around you and you're right in the middle of it, and you can see it happening. And that's how we found out about the lower astral. We didn't want to go there. They just took us there and showed us these things. So when you're in the room, you can see anything you want and have all knowledge that you want. 
So you can see why I love this, because this is what I, where I get the things I write about, is in the library. It's just so wonderful. So uh, that's the library. And the other places are the schools. Now they said in these schools, you also go to the level that you vibrate at, your frequency is at. You know, my idea of heaven, what they always talk about, floating around on a cloud, playing a harp, that'd be so boring. That's not for me. <laughs> I'm always looking for information. My idea of heaven is the schools. Because in these schools, you can have all knowledge of anything you possibly want. Everything is possible to be learned over there. So I asked them, OK, if you can learn everything there is over there, why do you have to come back to Earth? Wouldn't that be easier? They said, no, because. Over there, it's like book reading versus hands-on experience. You can read about it, but you're not experiencing it. And they said you do. You learn a lot, but it'll take much, much longer because you're not having the hands-on experience, the interaction with people. Because they said, yeah, you can read about uh, love, hate, jealousy. You say, well, it's not hard. I can do that. But you get down here, and you get in the middle of it, everybody else's emotions, it's not easy at all. But you learn so much more than you would over there. It's just like um, if you went to college and took chemistry, you're in the laboratory. You can read about chemistry, you can read about the chemicals, but do you really understand that you go into the library and start mixing the chemicals? You have to have the hands-on experience. The same way we're learning auto mechanics. You can read about how, how a motor works and how to tear it apart and put it together, but do you really understand Do you go and start taking it apart and putting it together? That's the difference. So they said that's why we choose to come back, because we can learn faster, we can pay our karma back, and we can be finished much easier. So we choose to come back, and we make our contracts with these other people. Now there, there is nobody sitting up there on a throne judging you and punishing you. People blame God for everything. Believe me, he is not doing this at all. You do it to yourself. You can't blame anybody but yourself. They say, I don't remember writing this script. But that's exactly what happens. You're the one who is writing this whole scenario. There's nobody up there who is judging you and punishing you. You see your life. You see what you have done. You see the people you have hurt. You make the contracts. You judge yourself. And there's no harsher judge than you yourself. You see you're the one that are creating this because you know it's, you have to pay these things back, and that's where karma comes in. So anyway, you make your contract, and you're ready to come back. Okay, you have your, your little package or your nice little plan. You come in and say, okay, I'm going to do all of this. I'm going to get it all done at one time. I'm going to really finish. I don't want to have to come back and do it again. This earth is hell. They've told me that many times. Earth is hell because that's where people hurt each other. It's not what you think it is. So that's why they don't want to really come here, but they know they have to in order to get it all worked out. So you make your plan. And the guides and the guardians and the elders and the masters are working with you as you're trying to make your plan. And there's, sometimes they will give you two or three different scenarios that you look at. This is the lives you can pick. Which one do you want to do? You want to be a man? You want to be a woman? You want to be an Eskimo? You want to I be mean, an Indian? What do you want to do? And you pick your scenario of what you want to be. Sometimes you want to take on too much because they'll say, I want to get it all done at one time. And they say, you know, it's not a very good idea. They can't tell you what to do. They can advise you, but they'll say, you know, it's going to be really hard if you do it like that. You said, oh, I don't care. I want to get it all done. It's like taking college and not leaving any time for extracurriculars. You just study, study all the time. You can't take it. It's too much. They said it doesn't matter if you get it all done at one time. You can always come back and do the rest. 
Do as much as you can, as good as you can. That's all you're expected to do. So they'll tell you, all right, if this is your decision, it's not going to be easy. We'll help you, but it's going to be hard. So you make the decision. You write the script. You pick the characters. You make all the agreements with them. I'm going to be your husband, wife, daughter. I'm going to meet you on a street corner sometime, and we'll be friends from then on. You try to write the whole scenario. You come in with your nice little plan, all wrapped up like a Christmas present. The problem is, <laughs> this is a planet of free will. So everybody else is coming in with their nice little plan. So it's all going to clash. So what they always say about best laid plans, I've had them go through the death experience and they'll say, what happened? I had it all figured out. <laughs> Life happened. So it's not perfect. But that's what it's all about. We're learning. We're learning lessons. We're trying to get better at it. We want to get off of the wheel until we can be finished and return to God and never have to come back here again. That's the idea. So we come in with our plan anyway. And to make it even more complicated, you're coming in with your plan, but you can't remember. Not allowed. <laughs> what are the rules? <laughs> Over there, everything is so clear, so plain, makes so much sense. But you come in, the blinders come down. You forget everything. And I asked them, I said, wouldn't it be a lot easier if we knew why we were coming here? We remembered. If we knew our connection with all these other people, wouldn't that make it a whole lot easier? They said, no, it wouldn't be a test if you knew the answers. <laughs> so you've got to come in totally blind to everything. And what they call it the blinders. And when you die, it's all taken off. And you say, oh, look at this. You know, if Then you're, you're back with total knowledge again. But when you come in, it's all shut down. I've had them go through the birth experience. And they're saying, got to remember, got to remember. <laughs> then they're born, and they'll say, I don't remember anymore. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons why babies you know, they have to go for the first two years of their life learning how to, to crawl and to walk and to talk. Because they're forgetting everything if they remembered anything at all. You've got to learn how to be a human being. It's not easy. Um, during the first two years of a baby's life, it's still going back and forth. That's why you sleep so much. The baby sleeps so much. It's still going back to the other side, getting last-minute instructions and last-minute advice from the council. And this is why older people, too, you notice when they're getting older and you think they're going to die, they start sleeping a lot. They're actually going back and forth and getting their instructions, and they know when they're going to go. Now, I said in the beginning, and I'll try to leave some time for some questions here. Uh, this, this is a big subject, and it's covered in, this is the book, it's called Between Death and Life. People always say, don't you have that backwards? Supposed to be between life and death. No, it's between death and life. Whole new existence between what you think it is. I wrote this, oh, it's been 15 years ago. It's in 20 different languages all over the world and more coming. So people said it's, it's very important, but it has all of the questions you could possibly want. It's a big subject, so I can't cover it all. I'm trying to hit the basics here. But, uh, let's see, where was I at there? Okay, you, you get down here then, and you, you have to start all over again with everything. Oh, yeah, the exit plan. Part of your plan that you make, your contract, you decide how you're going to die, how you're going to exit. You got to have a way to get out of the body. Nobody dies until they are ready to die. That may sound cold may sound hard to understand. They don't know this consciously, but on the other part where they have made their plan, they know they are planning to go out at a certain time. They know how they're going to do it. They say, well, it'd be interesting. I think I'll go out in a train wreck. I haven't done that for a while, so let's try that, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, you decide how you're going to do it. 
And you're the one that actually makes the plan of how you're going to leave the body when the time comes. You, you go out in groups. Some people come in in groups. They like to be in groups. And they'll say, OK, we're going to go out on an earthquake. We'll go out together. Are we going to go out with 9-11? Nothing is ever an accident. It's all planned ahead of time. So when you look, you know these things, you can look at all of this from a totally different perspective that uh, it's all, it's more of a plan to everything than you realize. When you understand that, you can control your life, just like Ron was saying. I give lectures on that too. Once you realize everything in your life you have put there, you have created, you have done it. People don't like that because sometimes their lives are a mess. But when they realize you have put it in your life, if you've created it, you can just as easily uncreate it. Once you realize the power that you have, we are a creative being. We can do anything we want. But I like to think sometimes if the person makes ch changes in the way they, they want to go out, they can stay longer if they want to. Because I've had so many different things like this happen. But really, when it comes time to go, you have decided to go. Uh, Dr. Bonnet, who uh, spoke here the last two years, I published three of his books, you know, and he, uh, he's a wonderful man. He was 45 years as a doctor, and he was the head of a hospital, and he was trying to teach how our minds heal the body. And he said that when he was in the hospitals, they would have a code blue, somebody with a heart attack, and it was an older person. He was taking his own sweet time getting to the room because he said he knew they wanted to go. Why keep them here? And he was waiting for, they want to go, let them go. And he said a lot of times he'd be standing around the bed with the other relatives and they're all crying and everything and they, he was telling them, let grandma go. She doesn't want to be here anymore. They're the only ones holding on to. He said she's sick, she's tired, she wants to go. But it takes another way of looking at all of this. And I don't know if this is bothering you or not, but people say when they realize what it's really about and where they go, and it's so extremely beautiful over there, their home, and they're so happy that they wouldn't feel bad about it. So there's a whole lot more to it, but uh, Julie, you back there? You want to get the microphone? And I've got time for some questions anyway. But uh, there's a lot because every, I don't think there's any, uh, some questions I wait because they're pretty uh, serious. And so if I give a longer lecture, we try to cover a lot of these. So um, just to cover as many questions as we can real quickly here. Okay. Well, go over there first. They had their hands up first. Okay. But it's, it's a lot to this anyway. I've spoken in Unity Churches about this, and the, the this ashram is, said this fits in exactly with their beliefs, too. Yeah? Uh, this is kind of a silly question, but when you're out traveling and astral traveling at night, and it comes at 3 a.m. time that you have to get up and go to the restroom. Uh, and I didn't get did that one. Okay. When you're, when you're traveling and you have to wake up in the middle of the night, Oh, when you're uh, okay, your does your up, cord, yeah. is it, do they, does the cord come back in when your body becomes awake again you're real for that then. break? Yeah, you're real then when it's time for the body to wake up. Oh, yeah, the body is saying, I need attention. So it brings you back in. <laughs> yeah. And the other question is, when you are ready to exit, do you know... Do you have that in innate knowing that that's yeah, it's my know. time? They're ready to go. Okay. I would like to say some people have told me uh, sometimes they wake up in the morning and they feel paralyzed and it scares them because they can't move. All it is is the connections have not been put back together again and the soul is entering the body again. They just wait a few minutes and it'll all be hooked back. Sometimes a person wakes up too quickly Maybe there's a noise or something that wakes them up before they're all the way back in their body. I had one woman said she went to the doctor. He spent $7,500 on sleep tests. And it's all it was at that she just wasn't hooked back up as she's coming back in the body. And these things are simple to understand when you understand how it works. Okay, one behind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you're a mother 
have been a nurturing mother, you pass away, and I understand the part about going to heaven, following the light. Um, I don't believe that they're up there playing golf and get to live in a beautiful house or anything like that. My thought is that they come back down, that God sends you back down into somebody that needs your help. Like uh, my mom passed away. Yeah. I have a sister that is dying of cancer. I just can't imagine uh, my mom just hanging up out there, having a good time, and God just sending her to school. And she's not helping my sister. How do you know she's not helping her? Oh, I know she's got to be. That's where she is. That's like where I she's said, got the your allies. Relatives are assigned to come back and take care of the ones who are yeah, still alive. You know, if they're needed. Yeah, I, I would, I would think so too. I just, you know. But otherwise, they're sitting up there, and I, and they're asked, "Do you want to come back?" And they said, "Oh no, they'll be here in the blink of an eye. Don't worry about it. They know you're coming." Really? So they've got their own life to live. Well, if that makes really? you feel any better or not. No. They know you'll be there eventually. <laughs> well, especially, you know, a child. You know, when a, when a parent passes, okay, there's a, usually a succession that you yeah. expect. And when a, you know, a younger child dies is in the... I have had that many clients come to me that their children have died and they're very upset about it. And during my work, see, we can contact the part of them that has all of the answers. And always says the same thing. Their contract was finished, they did what they had to do, they left. It affects us, but they do what they were doing. That soul is never a child soul, is never a baby soul. It's been around forever. So it makes a decision. Okay, I'll go in, I'll just live for a few years. Maybe my mother will learn something. Maybe the relatives will learn something. You have to look at it from a different viewpoint. Did you learn anything or not? That's the thing. So I do a lot of counseling with, with parents. So that's part of my work as a therapist. I do work with these people on their problems. And so I've heard this a lot, and it does help them. I had one woman who was grieving for her sister. And instead of going into a past life, she went to the other side, and she saw her sister walking toward her through this beautiful garden. And as she got up, she said, telling her, she said, her, she's talking to her sister, and she says, what happened? We thought you were getting well. What happened? She said, with my time. She said, let me go. Can't you see how beautiful it is? Live your life. Because she, that was her plan. But she said, can't you see how beautiful it is? Let me go. But I did what I was supposed to do. And you look at it from a different viewpoint like that. It, it takes a change of where we've been taught. But you can see everybody has their own plan. And your part in it is how do you react to it? How did it affect you? You learned something or not? Yeah. Okay, we've got to just a little just bit. Just one more question I want to ask about something that's been, I've been wanting this to know for a long time. This is not an easy time. subject, I know. So I, deal um, with, I deal with this a lot, yeah? I've studied this subject a lot too, and I've, I know a lot of the things that you've said, but the one thing I've always questioned is someone that comes in retarded, are they going to be able to, or many things that they come in with, with real severe ailments or something, are they able to make a big step in that one lifetime? Mm -hmm. Is that what that's about? Yes, because you make yourself sick. There are, are, there are more souls in line for the handicapped bodies than for normal bodies. You can see why. Because usually they can, they can pay back more karma in one lifetime than it would take them 10 lifetimes to pay back. They're learning a lot, but what are they teaching others? The person who takes care of them? They are, anybody they come in contact with, how do you react when you see a handicapped person? They teach you everybody they come in contact with. And you're learning something from everyone you see. So there are more people in line for the bodies that are handicapped and diseased because they're learning and they're teaching other people. When I see somebody who in a wheelchair or who is a retarded child, I just think, you chose a hard one this time, didn't you? It's a different way of looking at it. 
Okay, just a few more here. Uh, there have been accounts written of people who have had near-death experiences that have been very, very negative. And I've never I, had a negative one. But I mean, I have chosen not to read those because I didn't want that in my consciousness. I have had, had them say if the person experiences a negative near-death experience because that's what they were expecting. From the brainwashing of church and everything, they'll say you're going to hell, you're not good enough, you're going to, nothing good can come out of this. They'll go to what they're expecting, but it's not real. So they don't stay there. They've told me that. It's, if that's what you're expecting, you'll see it. But a lot of it does have to do with the brainwashing. And uh, my daughter worked in hospital in intensive care for a long time. And she said the hardest things that she had to witness were these older people dying. And they're saying they're dying in fear because they said, I've been told by the church I'm going to hell because I'm not perfect. And they knew, even though they lived a good life, I'm not perfect. So why should they die in fear just because the church says that's the way it should be? So that's what I mean, you've got to get rid of that fear because then naturally they're gonna see something awful because that's what they've been promised. But it, you don't stay there. Well, I didn't read what? Yeah, because there are people that write these kind of things. But I've done enough cases that, and they've told me time and time again, it, it doesn't happen. But it's, if you're expecting it, anything you believe is real, you know. Okay. Yes, I have a true story. A friend of mine, uh, about two years ago, she was spent about 10 years looking after her mother, who was gradually dying. She had no other it's one. It's hard to, I can't understand. Should, should I? Oh, have it put it down a little bit. It, it's here? very distorted, yeah. Does this sound better? A, up a little bit. Now? Now? Yeah. Try there, okay. See, I need help. <laughs> I'll see. Thank okay. you. No, uh, it's a good friend of mine, and she had been looking after her mother, who was gradually uh, dying for many years. And I'll just sum it up. Say it took nearly 10 years. After about nine years, she was she moved to Oklahoma, and she said her mother got so weak, she needed care 24/7, and so on and so on. And but she said her mother was gradually dying. She could tell. And the nurses, two or three times that came in the night, thought she was just about dead, but she came back. And finally, one day, but she knew her mother was very concerned with her, because she was alone. She had no children. She was not married. She was concerned for her daughter, for my friend, Carol Jean. And she knew that her mother didn't want to leave her in this rented house that was full of mold and all this stuff. Her mother didn't want to leave her in a condition where her daughter would suffer. So... Her mother, one night, she said, I know my mother died. Of course, she had nurses training. She, she said, my mother's heart stopped. Uh -huh. Her blood, the blood test she gave her, she said, I couldn't bring her back. And she said, I just went on my knees and I prayed to God. And she said, then I went to get some medicine or to cover her up. And she said, I put the sheet over her face and all of a sudden, mother started breathing. This was after quite some time. So her mother lived another year. And in that time, my friend was able to buy a house, to clear out the mold, to change her life, to be able to prepare to do other work when her mother was gone. And a year later, almost to the day, her mother did pass on, and it was the same day that her father had passed on 15 years before. So she had a choice, apparently. Okay, in my work, I, you see what's happened here? Why would they die, be dying for so many years? Why did they have to have the person taking care of them all those years? Karma. There was karma between the two. It had never been worked out. If it had been worked out sooner, they would have, it would have been solved sooner. Because it wasn't, they were hanging on and hanging on and going on and going on with it, dragging it on much longer than it should have been. She was, but she, there was something there from another life that they was, they just wouldn't let go.